Thank you, Your Honor. Matthew McGill, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher for the plaintiffs. The plaintiffs called Dr. Michael Lamb. Michael Lamb called as a witness for the plaintiffs herein, having been personally sworn, and identified as follows. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but God? I do. Please have a seat. And state your name, please. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Lamb, spelt L A M B. Good morning, Dr. Lamb. Good morning, Mr. McGill. Dr. Lamb, what is your current occupation? Um, I am currently uh, a professor and the head of the Department of Social and Developmental Psychology at the University of Cambridge in England. And before you held your position at the University of Cambridge, what position did you hold before that? Uh, for 17 years before that, I was the head of the section on social and emotional development at the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development in Washington. And what did your duties as section head of the National Institutes of Health entail? Uh, my responsibilities were to conduct research uh, and to direct uh, a team of researchers studying issues that had to do with uh, children's social and um, uh, emotional development. And how long have you studied developmental psychology, Dr. Lamb? Well, I began studying um, developmental psychology in the uh, the, the, the 1970s and early 1970s, so nearly 40 years. And what are your primary areas of study within the field? Uh, there have been two broad areas of research on which I focused. Uh, the first uh, is unrelated uh, to the topic of this litigation, um, uh, but it has to do with the investigation of sex crimes involving children, and uh, particularly in the development of appropriate means of interviewing young children uh, who were allegedly um, uh, victims. Uh, the second line of research has to do with the factors and the, uh, that, that affect children's development and adjustment. What do you mean by the term adjustment? Uh, I use the term adjustment as a fairly broad term really to refer to those aspects of children's development that allow them to function uh, effectively in their current environment. So for example, um, a well-adjusted child would be one who has no significant um, uh, behavioral or psychological problems, who was able to interact uh, effectively and smoothly, not only with adults, but also with other children. Um, somebody who is able to perform well and uh, achieve appropriately at school. Um, if one is thinking about uh, older children, often one side of maladjustment would be uh, involvement in uh, antisocial or um, uh, delinquent behavior. Um, then as one goes into adulthood, uh, adjustment, would refer, uh, adjustment would refer to the ability to form uh, successful intimate relationships uh, with other individuals as well as to perform uh, effectively as a member of uh, society. Is there a body of literature that focuses specifically on the adjustment of children parented by gay men and lesbians? Uh, yes, there is. Can you describe in general terms the breadth and depth of that literature? Well, uh, it's a fairly substantial body of literature by this point. Um, it's a question which has been uh, or is being researched uh, since the late uh, 1970s uh, and early 1980s. And over the succeeding decades, has, there has uh, accumulated a large number, uh, maybe a hundred peer-reviewed professional articles, uh, many other reports uh, uh, in the fora. Um, so now that we have, so, so that now we have, I think, a very uh, a good understanding of the factors that affect the adjustment of children uh, being raised by gay and lesbian, uh, lesbian adults, uh, children, sorry, excuse me, um, uh, parents. And um, would, would you say that you're familiar with that body of research, Dr. Lamb? Yes, I think I am. Did you provide peer review for any of the reports included within that body of literature? Uh, yes, I have. And what is the purpose of peer review? Uh, the purpose of peer review is a procedure that uh, professional journals and publications use to ensure that the articles they publish um, and the report studies that have been uh, uh, appropriately conducted and that the uh, results obtained have been both appropriately analyzed and that they are not only reported accurately um, and appropriately, but also that they are integrated correctly uh, into the wider body of literature on that topic. 
Dr. Lamb, are you familiar with the various methodologies used in the field of developmental psychology? Yes, I am. And have you taught students on the subject of research methodologies? Uh, yes, I have. You, um, have you supervised other researchers in their own research efforts in developmental psychology? Uh, yes, I have, yeah. Dr. Lamb, have you authored or educated any books in the field of developmental psychology? Yes, I have. Um, I have also edited about um, 40 books. And in addition to the books that you've written, have you published any other writings relating to child development and adjustment? I have, yes. Approximately how many? Uh, I must have published in total maybe 500 articles. Uh, not all of them would be about adjustment, of course, but uh, some of them would be about interviewing. And where, for the most part, were those 500 articles published? Uh, well, they've been published, uh, for the most part, in professional peer-reviewed journals or in uh, chapters written for other professional and professional books. Do you serve on the editorial board of any academic journals? I, I do serve on several editorial boards um, and I have served on others in the past as well, yes. Can you name a couple of the journals on which you've served on the editorial boards? I've served on the editorial board of Child Development and Developmental Psychology, although I'm not currently a, a member of either of those boards. I'm currently on the editorial board of uh, Child Abuse and Neglect, uh, Developmental Review, Infant Behavior and Development, um, some others as well. How often would you say that you provide peer review for an academic article? I would estimate that I review approximately two articles a week, so maybe a hundred articles a year. And over the course of your career, about how many would this add up to? Um, well, at the beginning of my career, happily, I wasn't having to do as many as that, but I would say probably a good two and a half thousand to three thousand reviews in total. Dr. Lamb, have you received any honors recently from professional associations? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I received an award for lifetime contributions to psychology from the Association of Psychological Sciences in 2003. Dr. Lamb, in front of you, there are th you have three books and uh, then a binder. Using the tabs at the bottom of the binder, please turn to tab A. That document behind the tab there is exhibit PX2327. And Dr. Lamb, is exhibit PX2327 a copy of your curriculum vitae? It is, yes. And does that document list your educational degrees and publications? Yes, it does, yes. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to offer Exhibit PX2327 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. <coughs> Very well, 2327 is admitted. Uh, then, Your Honor, we would like to tender Professor Michael Lamb as an expert in the field of developmental psychology of children, including the developmental psychology of children raised by gay and lesbian parents. No objection, Your Honor. Very well, proceed then, Mr. McGill. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Lamb, uh, are you going to offer any opinions in this case? I am, yes. What are they? I'm going to offer two broad opinions. Um, the first is that we have a substantial body of evidence documenting, documenting that children raised by gay and lesbian parents are just as likely uh, to be well-adjusted as children raised by heterosexual parents. And I'm going to offer the opinion that for a, a, a significant number of these children, their adjustment would be promoted were their parents able to get married. Dr. Lamb, is there a consensus within your field as to the factors that most affect child adjustment? Uh, there is, yes. At this time, I would like to publish my first demonstrative. Uh, and while it's getting up on the screen, Dr. Lamb, uh, why don't you tell us what, are the, what, are, what those factors are? Well, as I said, um, there was... Uh, a substantial consensus uh, has, uh, has developed over the last 30 or 40 years of research um, documenting, d documenting that uh, the factors that affect children's development fall broadly into uh, these three categories of factors that are summarized on your overhead. Um, the first of these is the quality of the relationship that children have with their parents or with the people looking after them. Um, there is a large body of evidence uh, showing that children are better adjusted when they have good, uh, warm, close relationships with their parents um, who are committed to uh, caring for them uh, and looking after them. 
and that children's development is uh, conversely hindered uh, when they don't benefit from such a relationship uh, with, with people offering such uh, parental behavior. The second uh, set of factors have to do with the uh, relationships between the individuals who are raising the child. Um, and again, here we have a large number of studies showing that children's development uh, is adversely affected when there is a, a conflict between those individuals. Um, and on the other hand, the children benefiting from being in a situation where these adults have a harmonious relationship with one another. Um, and the final uh, set of factors have to do with the uh, circumstances in which those children are being raised. Um, children on average do better uh, when the uh, well when, when they when they grow up in circumstances where there are uh, um, adequate economic resources uh, and where children and their parents have adequate social and um, uh, emotional support. So Dr. Lamb, what makes a good parent? Um, a, a good parent is someone who it, well, it, is somebody <laughs> who is committed to, loves, uh, is engaged with, and um, and focuses their attention on that parent. I mean, uh, on on that child. Uh, a good parent is one who effectively is effective at reading the signals of the child, uh, understanding what that child needs, and and, and providing appropriate stimulation, guidance, and uh, setting appropriate limits for their children. Um, and, and parents who provide that kind of committed, um, loving care have children who are more likely uh, to be well-adjusted. Is it the same criteria that's applied to mothers and fathers of children? There's a substantial amount of evidence documenting precisely that, um, namely that what makes for an effective parent is the same regardless of whether that parent is a mother uh, or a father. I would now like to publish a second demonstrative and this one is a quote from Mr. Cooper's opening statement. Um, here he was quoting a speech of President Obama and I'll just read the quotation. We know the statistics that children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of schools, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. Dr. Lamb, how, does, how do you square that statement with your understanding of the field of developmental psychology? Well, I think there are a couple of things one needs to note uh, about this quote, first of all. Um, the first is that, of course, while it talks about some individuals being five, nine, or 20 times more likely to have some adverse outcomes, um, it doesn't say uh, in comparison to what, uh, which of course makes it somewhat difficult to understand exactly what's being said here. Uh, presumably these statistics refer to uh, uh, comparisons between children being raised by two heterosexual parents uh, as opposed to those who are growing up and living with a single heterosexual mother. Um, that is to say the statistics probably are not drawn from studies that are focused on children being raised by same-sex parents, either singly uh, or, or in couples. Uh, the third point to note is that the, uh, this citation of statistics doesn't address the important distinction between correlation and causality. Uh, it provides these statistics and uh, perhaps implies to many listeners that it is the absence of um, a father in and of itself that causes the adverse outcomes that are described here. Uh, well, it's a fairly substantial body of literature uh, by this point. Um, it's a question that has been well, it, it, uh, being researched uh, since the late 1970s and early 1980s. And over the succeeding decades, there has accumulated a large number, uh, maybe over 100 uh, separate peer-reviewed professional articles, uh, many other reports um, in, the, in other fora. So, so that now we, we have, I think, a very good understanding of the factors that affect the uh, adjustment of children being raised by gay and lesbian children, uh, excuse me, uh, parents. 
Uh, well, I think there are a couple of things that one needs to note about this quote, first of all. Um, the first is that, of course, while it talks about some individuals being five, nine, or, or, or 20 times more likely to have some adverse outcomes, it doesn't say in comparison to what, uh, which, of course, makes it somewhat difficult to understand exactly uh, what point is being made here. Um, presumably, these studies, uh, these statistics refer to uh, comparisons between children being raised by two uh, heterosexual parents as opposed to those who are growing up uh, and living with a single um, heterosexual mother. That is to say, the statistics probably uh, are not drawn from studies that are focused on children being raised by same-sex parents, uh, either singly uh, or in couples. The third point to note is that this citation of statistics doesn't address the important uh, distinction between correlation and, uh, and causality. Um, it provides these statistics and uh, perhaps implies that, uh, well, well, to many listeners, that uh, it is the absence of a father in and of itself that causes the adverse outcomes that are described here. Um, now, actually, the research, now uh, quite voluminous, shows that the absence of a father in and of itself uh, isn't crucial uh, as a factor. Um, Rather, what's important in accounting for these differences are the factors that you showed in the initial overhead, um, and that children are moral uh, that children are more or less likely to have some of these problems when they've suffered uh, the separation from one of their parents, um, for example, and, and, and therefore have had the or have been deprived of the benefits of that person's involvement in their lives. Um, when they've been exposed to significant degrees of conflict between the parents, uh, and when they have had to cope with um, significant degrees of economic deprivation that are often associated with uh, uh, divorce and separation. So those are the factors that better explain why you might have some of these differences. Uh, and it's important for a a researcher to ask those questions about why these differences exist rather than simply to note uh, the numbers themselves. Uh, the final thing missing here, um, and that would concern me as a summary of the evidence, is that it doesn't acknowledge the fact that uh, notwithstanding these differences, the majority of children growing up in families without their father are perfectly well adjusted. Dr. Lamb, did you ever hold the view that children need a family structure with a male parent to adjust well? You know, when I began my career in the early uh, 1970s, that was widely believed to be true. Um, and so when I began my research, it was with the presumption or, or, or prediction that this was likely uh, to be the case. My first research uh, was concerned with the exploring, uh, w with exploring attachments that young babies form uh, to their mothers and fathers. And I explored the, uh, in that early research the differences and, and the ways in which, uh, in which mothers and fathers behaved and, and asked whether those differences in fact were, were important, uh, whether they they did show that children uh, needed to be raised by a masculine as well as a, a feminine parent. Uh, the result of both my research and, more significantly, the, 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 the larger body of research that developed since the early 1970s has made it clear that the, the, that initial prediction um, was, was incorrect. And we now have, as a field, um, come to the conclusion that uh, as I stated earlier, um, that what makes for an, uh, an effective parent is the same whether or not you are talking about a mother or a father, um, and that children do not need to have a masculine behaving parental figure, uh, a father, uh, in order to be well adjusted. Is there any support for the view that children need to have a female parent to adjust as well? Uh, no. Uh, the same uh, is true with respect to that. 
how long has it been accepted as the consensus view within your field that uh, the three factors that you described earlier, as opposed to family structure, are the factors that most affect child adjustment? I think the fields began to coalesce around uh, well, I, I, and to focus on these issues from the early to mid-1980s. Um, and I would say that by the beginning of the 1990s, uh, this would have been the overwhelming consensus in the field. And if I could get into Cambridge and uh, take a class in developmental psychology, is this what I'd be taught today? Uh, it is. Do you have, um, you should have in front of you a copy of two books. One is your own book, The Role of the Father in Child Development, and that has been marked as PX 2266. <clears throat> The other book is by Susan Gollenbach, entitled Parenting, What Really Counts, and that is marked as DIX 792. Dr. Lamb, did these books inform your opinions in this case? Uh, yes, they did. And are these books representative of the body of research on the central factors that affect child adjustment? Yes, they are. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to offer into evidence exhibits PX 2266 and DIX 792. No objection, Your Honor. Very well, both are admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Lamb, have researchers within your field conducted any studies of the adjustment of children raised by gay and lesbian parents? They have, yes. And these studies have appeared in peer-reviewed journals? Uh, yes, they have. And I believe you testified before it was approximately 100 journals, uh, 100 studies, is that correct? Uh, well, there would be at least 100 peer-reviewed reports, yes. Who are the leading researchers in this field? Well, there are a number of researchers, uh, both here um, and in Europe. I think Dr. Charlotte Patterson and uh, Jennifer Wainwright at the University of uh, Virginia would be among those. Uh, my colleague, uh, Susan Glombock at Cambridge. And researchers such as uh, Anne Beauvais and, uh, and Henry Boss in the Netherlands would be among uh, some of the most significant uh, contributors to the literature. What methodology did these researchers employ in their studies? Uh, well, these researchers employ uh, a wide variety of uh, methodologies. They use, first of all, uh, different ways of recruiting subjects for study, uh, drawing upon both uh, convenience and representative samples in order to conduct their research. Um, and in the course of collecting data, they use uh, various techniques from uh, survey responses um, to the use of standardized tests to uh, using systematic interviews uh, of children, of their parents, of their teachers, and of course doing systematic observations of those individuals, both the parents as well as the children. So there are a wide variety of, uh, of, uh, of techniques that have been used in this field, as in most other research on children's uh, adjustment. And each of these methodologies you just described uh, are they each acceptable as accepted as reliable within your field? Yes, they are. And how would you say the researchers' use of diverse methodologies has affected the field? Um, well, I think from my point of view, the broader range of, of methods employed, the more confident one can be about the uh, results in a body of research. The more different sorts of techniques, uh, the more different types of research methods uh, of sampling, uh, the more different uh, the groups and samples that have been studied, the more confident one can be that, uh, that the results really are painting a, a consistent body of literature and uh, um, contributing to a, a, a coherent understanding of the factors that affect uh, children's development. Dr. Lamb, what is a representative sample, as that term is used in your field? Um, well, the term representative sample is one that is employed particularly by uh, sociologists and, uh, and demographers. And that involves trying to find or, or um, to collect a sample of individuals with some target population. Um, I, I, I mean, uh, to collect a, a sample of individuals within some target population, say, the population of the United States. Uh, and drawing a smaller number of people to study more intensively who uh, perfectly represent the characteristics of the population as a whole. Dr. Lamb, please turn to tab D at the bottom of your exhibit binder. And behind tab D, you should find four exhibits marked as PX778, 
PX 1066, PX 1111, and PX 1116. Dr. Lamb, did each of these, those studies employ a representative sample in their research? Uh, yes. Um, each of these uh, included representative samples. And did each of those studies study the adjustment of children of gay or lesbian parents? They do, yes. And did the studies inform your opinions in this case? They did, yes. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to offer into evidence exhibits PX 778, PX 1066, PX 1111, and PX 1116. No objection, Your Honor. Very well, they will be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Lamb, what is a convenience sample? Uh, well, a convenience sample is one that a researcher studies, and uh, because there are a group of individuals of the characteristics that you want to study who can conveniently be obtained for study. So, uh, for example, for a researcher doing a study on any topic, uh, but let's say on children being raised by lesbian parents living in the, uh, the, the, the Bay Area, uh, you would try and recruit lesbian mothers with children of the age you wanted to study who lived within easy access of the place where they were doing the research. And when do researchers in your field use convenience samples? Well, they use them quite frequently. Um, I would say that the majority of the research done by developmental psychologists actually use convenience samples. Is research using convenience samples generally accepted as reliable within the field of de developmental psychology? Absolutely. Please then turn to tab E uh, at the bottom of your binder. There you'll find three exhibits, PX 1055, PX 1101, and PX 1115. And also beside your binder, you should find a book, PX 1396. Did each of those exhibits, Dr. Lamb, use a convenience sample in the study of the adjustment of children raised by gay or lesbian parents? Yes, they did. Did each of, or did each of those studies inform your opinions in this case? Uh, yes, they do. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to offer new evidence exhibits PX 1055, PX 1101, PX 1115, and PX 1396. Objection? No objection, Your Honor. Very well, they will be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Lamb, what makes a study longitudinal? Um, a longitudinal study is one which, uh, in which the, 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 the same individuals are studied at several points over the course of their development. Um, that's contrasted with a, uh, a cross-sectional study, which might involve uh, choosing to study different people at chosen ages. And when might it be appropriate to use a cross-sectional design? Uh, well, it might be appropriate to use a cross-sectional design, uh, of course, in, in, in all of these uh, cases, the design you choose depends on the uh, research questions you have in mind. But for example, uh, your, but if, for example, your, your question was, um, do the events that happen shortly after children beginning school affect the adjustment of children? You might want to, start to do a study uh, comparing five-year-olds and 10-year-olds to see whether there were higher rates of maladjustment uh, in the 10-year-olds than the five-year-olds as one way of seeing whether uh, this was a, a significant period of time in which um, uh, adjustment uh, or uh, uh, maladjustments uh, emerged. Have any of the studies of the adjustment of children of gay or lesbian parents used a longitudinal study? Yes, they have. Please turn to tab F at the bottom of your binder. There you'll find just one exhibit, PX 1088. Dr. Lamb, is that study, PX 1088, is that a, a longitudinal study? I, yes, it is. And did that study inform your opinions in this case? Yes, it did. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to offer into evidence exhibit PX 1088. No objection, Your Honor. 1088 is in. Thank you, Your Honor. And now I just, uh, Dr. Lamb, I want to refer you back quickly to tab E, which um, for two exhibits that have already been admitted, PX 1101, uh, and then the book PX 1396. Uh, the book by Fiona Tasker and Susan Gollenbach, Growing Up in a Lesbian Family. Did both of those studies uh, also use a longitudinal design? Uh, yes, they did. Now, by contrast, have any of the studies of gay or lesbian parents used cross-sectional designs? 
Uh, yes, they have. So for that, let's turn to tab G, and I'll direct you to exhibit PX 1072. This is a study by Chan and others. Now, is this a cross-sectional study, Dr. Lamb? Yes, it is. And did it inform your opinions in this case? Uh, yes, it did. At this time, Your Honor, I would like to offer into evidence exhibit PX 1072. No objection, Your Honor. Very well, 1072 is in. Thank you. Now, uh, referring back to tab D, just very quickly, PX 1066. This is a study by Susan Gollenbach entitled Children with Lesbian Parents, a Community Study. And then PX 1116, this is a study by Jennifer Wainwright entitled Psychosocial Adjustment, School Outcomes and Romantic Relationships of an Adolescence with Same-Sex Parents. Uh, these have been previously admitted. <clears throat> did those studies use a cross-sectional design? Uh, yes, they did. Now, Dr. Lamb, finally, what is a literature review? Well, a literature review is a report, um, an article or a chapter written by a scholar attempting to synthesize the, 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 the body of literature with respect to some um, particular question or, or, or topic. And if you could please turn to tab H in your witness binder there. There you should find three exhibits, DIX 2424, PX 1384, and PX 1093. Are these three exhibits literature reviews, Dr. Lamb? Yes, they are. And did they inform your opinions in this case? Yes, they did. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to offer those three exhibits, PX 1093, PX 1384, and DIX 2424 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. So, Dr. Lamb, based on all of those studies we just admitted into evidence, what conclusions have you drawn with respect to the impact of gay or lesbian parents of children, on children's and adolescents' adjustment? Well, I think that those articles are representative of a, a, a much larger body of research focused on, on, on this question. Uh, documenting very conclusively that children who are raised by uh, gay and lesbian parents are just as likely to be well adjusted as children raised by heterosexual parents. Um, that's a conclusion that has been documented in studies using, uh, as I said, a, a variety of methods, uh, a variety of ways of, uh, of obtaining samples, asking different sorts of questions about various aspects of adjustment involving children and adolescents of dif different ages. And the conclusiveness of that evidence is, in my mind, further supported by the fact that the results obtained in the studies that involve gay and lesbian parents are completely consistent with our broader understanding of the uh, uh, factors that affect children's adjustment, um, as I explained at the beginning of my testimony. Would you say that your conclusions, Dr. Lamb, are reflective of a consensus within the field of developmental psychology? Yes, they are. Could you please turn to tab I in your binder? There you'll find PX 766. And what is that document, Dr. Lamb? Uh, this is a policy statement issued by the American Psychological Association entitled Sexual Orientation, Parents and Children, issued in 2004. And at this time, I would like to publish a demonstrative with some of the text from that policy statement. Dr. Lamb, uh, could you please read the text in the highlighted box to the top? This is 766? PX 766. Has that been admitted? Not yet, Your Honor. Let's admit it before we read from it. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, at this time, Your Honor, I would ask that you take judicial notice of the American Psychological Association's policy statement concerning the sexual orientation, parents, and children. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. 766 will be admitted. Uh, would you like me to read? Uh, yeah, please uh, read from the top box. <clears throat> uh, the first box reads, there is no scientific basis for concluding that Lesbian mothers and gay fathers are unfit parents on the basis of their sexual orientation. Then they cite to three reports. On the contrary, results of research suggest that lesbian and gay parents are as likely as heterosexual parents to provide supportive and healthy environments for their children. 
Dr. Lamb, do you believe that this policy statement from which you just read accurately summarizes the state of the social science research on the effect of gay and lesbian parenting on child adjustment? Yes, I think it does. And now, uh, and could you now read the second box, please? The second box reads, overall, results of research suggest that the development, adjustment, and well-being of children with lesbian and gay parents do not, mark, uh, do, do not differ markedly from that of children with uh, heterosexual parents. Dr. Lamb, do you believe that conclusion is adequately supported by the research in your field? I do, yes. Thank you. Now, are you aware of any other professional organizations that have issued policy statements on the subject of gay and lesbian parenting? Um, there are a number of other professional organizations that have issued those, yes. All right. I would like now to publish a demonstrative with the lists of the various associations. Uh, I will read those. That would be the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychoanalytic Association, the American Psychological Association, which we just discussed, uh, the Child Welfare League of America, the National Association of Social Workers, and the North American Council on Adoptable Children. Dr. Lamb, to your knowledge, have all of these professional organizations issued policy statements on the subject of gay and lesbian parenting? Uh, yes, all of them have. And could you please turn to tab J in your witness binder? Uh, there you will have seven exhibits marked as PX 753, PX 757, PX 762, PX 763, PX 768, PX 1025, and PX 1032. Now, are these exhibits the policy statements from the organization, organizations I just read into the record? Uh, they appear to be, yes. And are, are these policy statements from these national professional associations consistent with the opinions you have developed in connection with this case? Uh, they are, yes. Your Honor, at this time, I would ask that the court take judicial notice of the eight policy statements. You've already admitted one, PX 766, but I would ask that you now admit exhibits uh, PX 753, PX 757, PX 762, PX 763, PX 768, PX 1025, and PX 1032. No objection, Your Honor. Very well, those will be admitted. Uh, Dr. Lamb. Have you ever heard the view that children raised by gay or lesbian parents were at greater risk of suffering gender identity disorder than children raised by heterosexual parents? Uh, yes, I have heard that. Now, can you explain what gender identity disorder is? Gender identity disorder is a, um, a, a psychiatric or psychological problem which involves uh, an individual feeling uncomfortable with uh, his or her gender. And have researchers in your field studied whether children parented by gay or lesbian, by gay men and lesbians suffer from gender identity disorders more frequently than children raised by heterosexual parents? Uh, they have, yes. Um, gender identity disorders, uh, I should uh, uh, point out, are extremely rare. Um, and there is no evidence that they are more common when children are being raised by gay and lesbian parents. Please turn to tab B in your witness binder, which is marked as PX2350. This is an email from Ron Prentice, which attaches a, an article entitled 20 Reason, 21 Reasons Why Gender Matters. Did you review this document in connection with your work in this case? I did, yes. Your Honor, at this time, I would ask that we admit PX2350. No objection, Your Honor. PX2350 is admitted. 2530 is admitted. Uh, it's 2350. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 23. Yes, my mistake. Yeah. Did I transpose them? It's 20. Is it 2350? Yes, it is, Your Honor. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, at this time, I would like to publish a demonstrative from 2350. Dr. Lamb, could you please read the highlighted section? Uh, yes, the text says, one of the main examples of gender confusion is what some are calling gender disorientation pathology. 
this is the term used to describe uh, homosexual, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender relationships. In these and other cases, there was a major distortion or, 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 or disordering of the male or female gender and a confusion of both gender and sexuality. Dr. Lamb, are you familiar with the term gender disorientation pathology? I am afraid I'm not, no. I don't believe it's one that is used in the psychiatric or psychological uh, literature. As it's used in the field of developmental psychology, what is a pathology? A, a pathology is a, a psychological disturbance that makes it difficult for a person to, to, uh, to function appropriately. Um, and when one uses that term, um, it would signify that the disability is sufficiently great that some kind of therapeutic or, or treatment is needed in order to deal with it. Dr. Lamb, does the field of developmental psychology describe gay and lesbian sexual orientations as a pathology? No, it does not. Why not? Well, those are not categorized as pathologies. They are parts uh, 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 as normal variation, uh, and they are considered to be um, aspects of well-adjusted behavior. Have studies in your field examined whether children parented by gay men or lesbians are more likely to develop a gay or lesbian sexual orientation themselves? Yes, they have. And what are the conclusions that those studies have reached? Those studies have shown that there, are, that there, is, there is no significant increase in the proportion of children who become gay or lesbian themselves when they are raised by gay uh, or lesbian parents. Uh, I would now like to publish my next demonstrative from the Why Gender Matter Matters article. Dr. Lamb, could you please read the highlighted text? Yes, the highlighted text says, while various studies indicate that around 2 to 3 percent of persons have ever practiced homosexual behaviors in their lifetime, a study in developmental psychology found that 12 percent of the children of lesbians became active lesbians themselves. Dr. Lamb, does the text that you just read not call into conclusion, uh, not call into question the conclusion you just gave the court? No, it does not, because the reference study is that, that is cited uh, here as, a, as, as footnote 84 uh, reported that there was no significant difference between the group of children raised by lesbian mothers and the group of children being raised by heterosexual mothers. And you were familiar with the study cited in footnote 84? I am, yes. Do you know who wrote that study? It was a study conducted by Susan Glombach uh, and her colleagues. And how do you know Susan Glombach, Professor Lamb? Well, I've known of her research for, for many years. Um, she's now a colleague of mine at the University of Cambridge. Does the research in your field establish ways in which children raised by gay men and lesbians might differ the, from children raised by homosexuals? <coughs> it does, yes. I'm sorry, heterosexuals? Uh, it does, yes. Um, there have been a number of studies that have, for example, shown that in some cases children raised by gay and lesbian parents have less sex stereotyped attitudes than those being raised by heterosexual parents. And can you give me an example of a sex stereotyped attitude? Um, well, the most obvious ones would, would have to do with the children's understanding uh, or, or aspirations for themselves. Um, children who are more sex stereotyped might think, for example, that girls uh, should aspire to be nurses, um, while boys aspire to be doctors. Um, that there are uh, certain behaviors that are more appropriate for boys than for girls. And within your field, is a child's failure to adopt sex stereotyped attitudes viewed as a maladjustment? No, it's not. It's viewed as an aspect of normal variation. Thank you. Uh, I would now like to turn to my next demonstrative from 21 Reasons Why Gender Matter article. Could you read the two highlighted boxes, please, Dr. Lamb? The sad truth is homosexual abuse of children is proportionally higher than heterosexual abuse of children. It must be stressed that most homosexuals do not abuse children, and most are not pedophiles, but it seems a significant number do and are. It is the right of the child to know and have a relationship with their biological mother and father. It is the right of the child to be protected from sexual exploitation. Gender disorientation pathology greatly increases the risk 
that children will suffer sexual exploitation. It is our duty to protect them. Dr. Lamb, do you agree with the statement that homosexual, homosexual orientations, quote, greatly increases the risk that children will suffer sexual exploitation? Absolutely not. It is clearly established that children are at no greater risk of abuse when being raised by gay and lesbian parents. Do you agree with the statement that it is the right of the child to be protected from sexual exploitation? Absolutely. Then why do you not agree with the statement that being raised by gay or lesbian parents increases the risk that sexual, that increases the risk that children will suffer sexual exploitation? Because there is no evidence that gays or, or lesbians are more likely to sexually abuse children. Has that hypothesis been disproven by researchers in your field? It has, yes. And when was the first time you can recall it was disproven? Oh, well, this is one of those fairly old canards. So the very earliest, very earliest report I can think of that I'm familiar with was published in the late uh, 70s. Then there have been parties published in the 70s, 80s, and 90s documenting various ways in which this is simply not true. Is one of the articles to which you were to which you are referring an article by Carol Jenny entitled Are Children at Risk for Sexual Abuse by Homosexuals published in Pediatrics in 1994? Yes, that would be one of them. Is there any social science in your field or any which you are aware that supports the notion that children need to be protected from gay men or lesbians? Uh, no, there is not. Is it true, Dr. Lamb, that children and adolescents raised by gay and lesbian parents sometimes are teased or bullied by their peers? Uh, yes, it is. And have researchers in your field studied whether children of gay or lesbian parents have more difficulty forming healthy relationships with peers than children raised by heterosexual persons? Yes, they have. What do those studies conclude? Well, the studies conclude that whether or not children are raised by heterosexual or same-sex parents there were no differences in their ability to establish uh, appropriate social relationships with their peers, either as children uh, or as adolescents. So what inference can be drawn from the fact that children and adolescents raised by gay and lesbian parents are sometimes bullied by their peers? Well, the studies have explored, uh, that have explored this in more detail show that while children with gay and lesbian parents are more likely to be teased about their family configuration, um, they aren't more likely to be teased in general. Um, children tease one another for a variety of reasons. Uh, children get teased because uh, their ethnic group is different, uh, because they have curly hair, because they're fat, because they have a funny accent. Children can be very cruel to one another. Uh, and when it's possible to tease somebody about the sexual orientation of their parents, uh, they may be teased for that, but it doesn't uh, uh, mean that they're more likely to be teased overall. Uh, I would like to publish my next demonstrative from the 21 Reasons Why Gender Matters article circulated by Ron Prentice for use in sermons. Could you read the highlighted box? Um, there was also the question of how children fare when raised in same-sex families. One person who has spent a lot of time looking into this question is psychologist Dr. Nicolosi. He argues that kids raised by homosexuals are traumatized emotionally and socially. Dr. Lamb, is there any social science in your field or any which you are aware that supports the notion that, quote, kids raised by homosexuals are traumatized emotionally and socially? No, there is not. Dr. Lamb, who is Dr. Joe Nicolosi? Well, um, I have to confess, I, don't, I, I didn't know who he was when I saw this document. So I searched for him on the internet and discovered that he is a psychologist who practices conversion therapy uh, for homosexual individuals. Dr. Lamb, are you familiar with the notion of the necessity of gender differentiated parenting? Uh, yes, I am. Can you? Please describe what the concept of gender differentiating parenting entails. Um, well, this is a, a concept that we talked about briefly earlier on, um, holding that in, in order to be well adjusted, children um, need to be raised by a male parent as well as a female parent. And as I said earlier on in responding to you, uh, there is now 
a significant body of inter- uh, of of evidence documenting that uh, that that's really not true. That what's important for children's development and adjustment is the, uh, the 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 quality of parenting that they obtain from the people who are raising them, and that the the, the gender is not one of the important uh, dimensions. Uh, I would like to publish my next demonstrative from the 21 Reasons Why Gender Matters article circulated by Ron Prentice. Dr. Lamb, could you read the highlighted box, please? We should disavow the notion that mummies could make good daddies, just as we should disavow the notion that uh, of radical feminists that daddies can make good mummies. The two sexes are different to the core, and each is necessary culturally and biologically for the optimal development of a medium being. Dr. Lamb, in the quote you just read, to whom is it attributed? It's attributed to David uh, Popeno, uh, who is a sociologist recently retired from Rutgers University. Is Dr. Popeno a leading proponent of the notion of the necessity of gender differentiated parenting? Uh, yes, he is. Is there anyone else who you can think of who is a proponent of the theory of gender differentiated parenting? The other person who comes to mind is David Blankenhorn. And do you believe that the notion is adequately supported by the social science in your field? Uh, no, I believe it's not supported by the social science research. Is there any social science in your field or any of which you are aware that supports the conclusion that a parent's failure to observe traditional gender roles will harm a child? There is not. Dr. Lamb, are you aware of the notion that the ideal family structure for children requires a child to be raised by the mother and father who are the child's genetic parents? Uh, yes, I am. And is there any basis in the social science research in your field for the conclusion that the absence of a genetic relationship between parent and child will increase the likelihood of poor adjustment outcomes for that child? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Is there any basis for the conclusion that the absence of a genetic relationship between uh, parent and child increases the likelihood of poor adjustment outcomes for the child? There is no support for that. Is there any social science of which you are aware that tends to contradict it? Yes, there is. Um, there have been a number of studies that address that issue, um, including many studies that focus on children who've been adopted, um, as well as a number of studies focused on children who've been uh, conceived through a variety of, uh, of reproductive uh, technologies, which lead them to be being raised by um, parents who are not their biological parents. And what did these studies conclude? Uh, those studies showed that children are just as likely to be well adjusted uh, uh, as children who are being raised by their biological parents. Now, if you would please uh, turn to tab M in your witness binder, Dr. Lamb. Uh, and there you should find three exhibits PX779, PX1100, and PX1108. Dr. Lamb, do these articles exemplify the research you just described? demonstrating that children without a gen genetic relationship to parents are just as likely to adjust well as children who are genetically related to their parents? Uh, they do, yes. And do these articles inform your opinion in this case? Yes, they do. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, I would like to move into evidence exhibits PX779, PX1100, and PX1108. No objection, Your Honor. Very well, they are admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Lamb. In your expert opinion, is there any way that prohibiting same-sex couples from marrying could be expected to improve the adjustment outcomes of their children? No, there is not. Is there any way that prohibiting same-sex couples from marrying could reasonably be expected to improve the adjustment outcomes of any child? I don't think so. Now, when an unmarried, cohabitating couple marries, does that improve the likelihood that their child will achieve good adjustment outcome? Y yes, it definitely can. Why? Because it allows those children to benefit from some of the advantages that, uh, that, that, that accrue to marriage, uh, including the fact that it's a recognized social institution. And so being able to consider the, 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 uh, and so being able to consider themselves part of a, uh, a well-recognized institution can uh, be beneficial for some students, some uh, uh, children. And is that study supported by social science in your field? 
is that conclusion supported by social studies sciences, social science studies in your field? Uh, yes. Is there any reason that that conclusion would not hold true if an unmarried cohabitating couple were gay or lesbian? No, it's not. In the thousands of books and publications that you've written and reviewed in your <clears> career, <throat> have you ever encountered a sound rationale for purposefully denying a child the opportunity to achieve the best possible adjustment outcome? No, I have not. I have no more questions, Your Honor. Very well, thank you, Mr. McGill. You may cross-examine Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Your Honor. We've, uh, the first of several installments of binders, we'd like to hand out our first two sets of binders, if we may. May I approach, Your Honor? Uh, you may. Good morning. Dr. Lamb. Uh, good morning. You've been a member of the American Civil Liberties Union, is that correct? That is correct. And uh, a member of the National Organization of Women, is that correct? Yes, it is. And a member of the NAACP, is that correct? Yes, it is. And a member of Amnesty International, is that correct? Yes. And the Nature Conservancy, is that correct? Yes. And you have even given money to PBS, is that correct? <laughs> So we can agree you are a committed liberal, is that right? I wouldn't say I'm necessarily a committed liberal. You believe that gays and lesbians should have the right to marry, correct? That's what I testified, yes. Okay. And you personally approve of same-sex marriage, is I that do. right? Okay. You are not a clinical psychologist, correct? That's correct. You have never treated patients, correct? That's correct. The last time you actually interviewed a child as part of a study was over 20 years ago, correct? Yes, that is correct. You have never interviewed... Uh, may I just interrupt? Um, that was my best guess at the time of the interview uh, of the de deposition. It's still my best guess now. Okay. You can't remember the last time you interviewed a child in study. Is that, uh, is that in your testimony? I, I can't remember the date of the last time I did, that's correct. But you think it was more than two decades ago? I think it was around two decades ago, I think. You've never interviewed a child of a gay male couple in any professional capacity, correct? That's correct. You've never interviewed the child of a lesbian couple in any professional capacity, is that correct? Correct. You've never completed a study of children raised by gay and lesbian parents, correct? That's correct. You would doubt that the members of the American Psychological Association would unanimously endorse the positions you have taken in this case, correct? Unanimously? No, probably not. And you don't have any idea as to what percentage would agree with you, correct? No. Okay. I'd like to ask you a, a few questions about the role of politics in modern day science. You would agree that social sciences, like psychology, are not hermetically sealed from political influence, correct? Well, I think none of us are medically sealed from the world around us, if that's what you mean. Well, you would agree that governments in the United States and Great Britain are not immune from the influence of politics and ideology, correct? Um. <laughs> that may be the second thing we agree on today. And universities are not free from the influence of politics, correct? Well, they are rife with politics with a small p. Um, how much they're influenced by politics with a big p I'm not sure. Universities are not free from the influences of ideological forces, correct? I'm not quite sure what you mean. Well, in other words, if there's a prevailing ideology within a society, that often manifests itself at universities, correct? Well, well yeah. Th there would probably be some people who have a, a variety of ide ideological views, yes. And think tanks often reflect a particular ideolog uh, ideological view, correct? I think that's correct, yes. And some major charitable organizations often reflect a particular ideological point of view, correct? Well, I'm not sure about that, but perhaps. Um, I can't think of any as we talk. Funding for sophisticated, high-quality psychological research is often provided by governments, universities, think tanks, and major charitable organizations, correct? Objection. Compound question. Sustained. 
funding for sophisticated, high-quality psychological research is often provided by governments, correct? Uh, yes, it's usually provided by government research agencies. Okay. And the funding that is available for studies dictates, to a large extent, the types of studies that are conducted, correct? Uh, can I suggest, um, I think your question presumes that the decisions are being made by governments about what sort of topics should be, discussed, should, should, should be studied here. In, in fact, uh, certainly in this country, agencies like the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health pride themselves on having peer reviewers evaluate the scientific quality and integrity and importance of the research. And I think they would vociferously object to the implication that it is a government ideological identification of the importance of a problem that determines what gets funded. You've mentioned peer review here and in your direct testimony. Have you read any, any of the emails about the East Anglia Climate Gate? I haven't read any of the emails, but I've certainly heard about them. Okay. And isn't it possible that even in the peer reviewing process, politics can seep into that process? Well, I have to say, based on my experience doing it, that that's not seen to be a factor. Now, let's talk about consensus and the importance of consensus within the scientific community. You would agree that history is littered with scientific theories that were widely accepted within a scientific community and that have proven to be wrong, correct? Well, I'm not sure about that. Well, let's take phrenology. Phrenology was widely accepted within the scientific community, correct? Well, I think, and I'm not an expert on the history of science or the history of phrenology, but I think it's more accurate to say that at a time there were several people who believed strongly in it. Um, whether it represented all the knowledgeable individuals who might have constituted the field of psychologists or neurologists at that time, uh, it would be more debatable. But all the scientists who believed it were wrong, correct? Yes. And Freud's theory? M may we just point out that um, Many of them weren't scientists. Some of them were. The founder of it was Franz Gall, is that right? Do you know? I don't know. But there was a time when Freud's theory of psychoanalysis was widely accepted by many psychologists, correct? Particularly by psychiatrists and treating clinical psychologists, yes, that's correct. But today, most contemporary psychology bears little resemblance to and makes little more than passing references to psychoanalysis, correct? Objection. Compound. Do you understand the question? Uh, yeah, I do. All right. Objection overruled. I think that, it's, that that's probably true if you're referring to the body of scientific psychology and research. I think that it wouldn't necessarily be true if you were talking about you know, a, a therapeutic, clinical context. Uh, there are certainly pockets of places where psychoanalysis holds, but certainly it's, it's my view that it's beyond some rather broad contributions it made to the field, and, and that's not a major intellectual player today. I'd like to direct your attention to tab one. Binder 1, which is your deposition in the case, and to page 191, line 9. Please let me know when you're, when you're there. Uh, I'm there. And you gave the testimony. Answer. So that I think it's not unfair to say that most contemporary psychology bears little resemblance to and makes little more than passing references to psychoanalysis. And you gave that testimony, correct? That's correct. All right. With respect to homosexuality, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was widespread consensus within the psychological community that homosexuality was a pathological condition, correct? I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I think that's correct. And the psychological community was entirely wrong, wasn't it? Well, that proportion of the scientific... of, of the psychological community that held that belief was wrong, yes. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to your... To, Tab 7, which is in your second binder. The way these binders are organized is tab 1 has your testimony in this and many other cases, and then the second binder has some Sorry, of the... Sorry, I, I don't have it yet. Hang on. I apologize. These documents are upside down. 
Yeah, uh, okay. I apologize about that, Your Honor. Well, I see. <laughs> we all have the same problem. All right. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry about that, Your Honor. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right, uh, Dr. Lamb, I would like to refer your attention to tab seven, and this is PX1026. It's a policy statement of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. I'm afraid I didn't memorize, Your Honor, every PX that was being moved in, but in an abundance of caution, I would like to ask the court to take judicial notice of PX1026. I assume there's no objection to admitting 1026? No objection, Your Honor. Very well. <clears throat> uh, I don't believe it was previously admitted. Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Lamb, referring your attention to the second paragraph, it says, Lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender individuals historically have faced more rigorous scrutiny than heterosexual people regarding their rights to be or become parents. The American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry opposes any discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity against individuals in regard to their rights as custodial, foster, or adoptive parents. Dr. Lamb, there's not a rich empirical literature relating to child outcomes of transgen transgender individuals, is that right? I'm not familiar with it, no. And there is not a rich literature on the child outcomes of the children of bisexuals? correct? That's correct. So the statement is not based on empirics, but rather in politics, correct? Well, I can't speak to the basis. Um, that would be my understanding, yes. Okay. As for the American Psychological Association, you simply don't know whether any non-scientific considerations play a role in the APA's treatment of same gender issues. I, I, well, I'm not a member of the APA. I wasn't involved in its discussion, so I have no idea. During your, I would like to ask you some more definitional matters so that during our time today, we're on the same page in terms of the terms we are using. You referred to gays and lesbians, and my first question is, is the accepted conclusion that there are probably somewhere around 2% of the adult population that is gay or lesbian? I think that's the consensus. I think most people often express it as a, as a range, but it would be a range around that, yes. And, but for you, your belief is that the accepted conclusion is that there are probably somewhere around 2% of the adult population that is gay or lesbian, correct? Uh, yes. I'm not a demographer, but that sounds like about the right figure that I hear people talk about. Well, there are some individ individuals who might consider themselves to have a, a same-sex orientation but do not have the erotic component as part of that identity, correct? Again, that's moving outside the area of my expertise, um, but it's probably true. And for the purposes of most of the research you rely upon, you were talking about individuals who define themselves as having a sexual orientation towards members of the same sex and would self-identify as lesbian, gay, or heterosexual, correct? That's correct. And you use the term gender orientation and sexual orientation interchangeably, correct? I confess that I do. I'm, I'm trying to be better behaved and uh, talk about it more particularly. <laughs> In the past, you have used the term gender orientation as the sexual object focus of sexual romantic interest, correct? I may have done it. It, it doesn't sound like a word that I would normally use, but I may well have done so. Well, let me just refresh your recollection. Let's turn back to Binder 1 and to your deposition testimony in the Howard case. That was a case, um, was it in Arkansas, Dr. Lamb? Uh, yes. And that would be behind tab 4, and I would like to direct your attention to page 18. Uh-huh. And lines 11 through 15. And let me know when you're there, Doctor. Which line, sorry? Lines 11 through 15. You were asked, question, you say gender orientation, how would you define that answer? Gender orientation as defining one's sexual, the, the sexual object focus of sexual romantic interest. Objection. Whether that is focused on male or female, did you give that testimony? Is there an objection? Objection. 
What is the objection? Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, there's nothing to impeach. Your Honor, the witness said he wasn't, he, he couldn't recall whether he had used it or not, and I want to refresh his recollection. For that purpose, you may. Does this refresh your recollection that you've defined it during your Howard deposition and the way that's reflected here? Uh, yeah, I suspect that the word object is a mistranscription of something that I said. Um, but the focus of sexual romantic interest is what I was trying to say. So I, I, I'm not trying to dispute it. I, I suspect that the word object wasn't used, but I don't have a great problem with that. Well, you also refer to the term well-being and psychological adjustment, and you use those as synonyms, correct? Uh, yes. And you use both terms as fairly broad terms to comprise a variety of possible ways of assessing how well children are doing psychologically as individuals, correct? That's correct. And you are not explicitly trying to exclude any index of mental health when you use the term well-being, correct? I think that's correct, yes. You would concede that there are still many differences between men and women in our society, correct? Yes. Men are much more likely to be incarcerated for committing a crime than a woman, correct? That's correct. There is evidence that men are more likely to be engaged in violent altercations, correct? Yes. Men are more likely to be aggressive, correct? Yes. Men are more likely to be alcoholics than women, correct? I think so. The death of a parent, excuse me, women live longer than men, correct? Uh, on average, yes. Yeah, and the death of a parent is a traumatic event for a child, correct? It can be, yes. Men and women get different types of diseases at different rates, correct? Yes. And the health of parents can have an effect on the psychological well-being of children, correct? Yes. The intelligence of parents can have an effect on the psychological well-being of children, correct? Well, that's a trickier one. I, I, I'm not sure that the intelligence of parents directly affects the well-being of their children. I well, it's certainly possible that if someone, if, if someone were able to get into Cambridge, then come learn about your processes, they'd be in a better position to be a good parent than if they were illiterate and never heard of them, right? Well, I'm not sure that's true. Um, I'm not sure that better educated people are necessarily always better parents. I suppose that uh, you could make the case that people who had extremely low levels of intelligence might make it difficult for them to perform some of the functions of parenting. Um, it could, it could indirectly affect children's adjustment. All right. Well, let's look and see if there are any differences in the bell curve between men and women. And I direct your attention to tab eight of your binder. Um, back, back to the other binder? Yes. Okay. And in particular, I'd like to direct your attention to page seven of 19, as reflected in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh-huh. And it says, in the second to last sentence, and this is I should say for the record, is a document written by a, a Diane Halpern, who is a professor at Claremont McKenna, and she writes, there are also disproportionately more males at the low end of cognitive abilities disruption, with males overpresented in some categories of learning disabilities and retardation. The low end of verbal abilities provides a very clear example of this. Isn't it true that men well, if you look at the, the Homer Simpsons of the world, there are a lot more men than women. I suspect that she's talking of people who are performing much less well than Homer Simpson, but uh, <laughs> yes. I didn't know that that was possible, but all right. Now, men drop out from high school at greater rates than women, isn't that right? Um, currently, I believe that's true, yes. And men graduate from college at lower rates than women, correct? Well, I'm not sure about that. I, I, I know those statistics have been changing and uh, probably are different in different contexts, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Educational attainment of the parents is a predictor of psychological well-being and adjustment, correct? It, it can be associated with some of the processes we talked about, yes. And we can also agree that men can't be breastfed, correct? Or, um, excuse me, they cannot breastfeed, correct? That's correct. And breastfeeding clearly is benefits for children insofar as it helps to provide sources of immunity to children that are beneficial to them, correct? That's correct. Economic resources are quite reliably a predictor of differences in children's adjustment, correct? That's correct. 
And it's re a regrettable fact that women in the United States continue to earn less than men, correct? Yes, I think that's true. And do you know whether lesbians on average have higher or lower household income than heterosexual couples? I'm not sure. No. There are differences between the earning power of gay men and lesbians, correct? I'm not sure. That's Well, let's just look and see whether you have a reaction to the uh, what's behind tab 9, which is uh, DIX 96. And this is the expert declaration of Lee Badgett. Of Lee Badgett submitted in the uh, remarriage cases in California. And she says on page 5 of this document in paragraph 13, contrary to a popular stereotype, same-sex couples in California have household incomes that are comparable to their married counterparts. After controlling for educational attainment, race, and age, male couples' average household income is approximately 4% higher than married couples' average household income. While female couples' average household income is approximately 7% lower than married couples' household income. And that would be, it would be important to hold constant for the level of resources available to a family in terms of doing the types of studies you rely on. Is that fair to say? Uh, that would be fair to say. 